B'Shem Hashem Na'asev and Asliyah. Welcome everyone, welcome back to our weekly shiur on the parasha with the perush of the Zerah Shimshon. It's good to be back. I tried getting everybody together for weeks now and it seems you guys didn't want to come to a shiur, but I'm glad. <laughs> but Baruch Hashem, for whatever reason, things change and you're back. That's great, it's great. Understand the importance of maintaining a schedule, of keeping the class schedules. Come every week. Nothing should hold us back. We shouldn't cancel classes. You know, the, <clears throat> so not that that's out of the way. <laughs> um, the Shior and the Zechut of the Zerah Shimshon, who made a promise that whoever learns his Torah and shares his Torah, and whoever needs children, may HaKadosh Baruch Hu give them children. Those that need to be married, may HaKadosh Baruch Hu send them. Their zivug hagun beqarob uizmano amen keni ratzon. And shefa barachav aslacha lekol am Yisrael. This year is also dedicated, um, and the food is sponsored for Leilu Nishmat Morenu Ovadia Ben Yaakov Ve Georgia. Morenu Barabenu Harab Ovadi Yosef Zechad Sadiq Vekadosh Libracha, whose your side was today. Uh, may his zikhut be a melitz yosher for all of us and bring shalom to Am Israel. May Hashem in his zikhut release all the hostages and bring them home to their families. Make sure all the soldiers are safe and bring them home to their families safely. Amen. Um, also, the shiur is. Uh, Sponsored partially by Dean Barron. Thank you so very, very much. May Akadosh Baruch Hu give you Shefa, Barachah, Batzlacha, and everything that you do. Amen. Keneratzon. Also sponsored anonymously for the success of um, uh, their daughters and the Zivug Hagun for their daughters. May Akadosh Baruch Hu give their family, uh, all the daughters, Bezrat Hashem, should find their Zivug Hagun. Amen. Keneratzon. Okay, here we go. So the parasha we're doing this week is parashat Lech Lecha, Tavshin Pei Hei. Um, a beautiful derush of the Zerah Shimshon. I'm not going to start with an introduction. We'll go right into it. Then there's parts that I'll have to give a little tiny intro so that um, everyone understands where the Zerah Shimshon is coming from. For those of you that are new to the Zerah Shimshon, Zerah Shimshon could at times be very deep. I try to... Uh, um, minimize its depth. I try to simplify it as much as I can, but please understand that if I'm not simplifying it, it's because I don't understand it. I don't get it myself, so we're in the same boat. But the zikhut and the sgula still works because we're learning his Torah. I try my best, really. Um, I'm not a Kabbalist on Monday nights. Here we go. Midrash. There's a pasuk in Shir Hashirim by Shlomo HaMelech, the Pasuk says, Achot lanu katana, v'shadayim en la, ma na'ase la achotenu b'yom sh'yidu bar ba. Im chomahi nivna aleha tirat kasef, v'im delet hi nasur aleha luwah arez. Ani choma v'shadayim k'migdalot, az hayiti b'inav k'moset shalom. The translation is, there is, we have a young sister, v'shadayim en la, she is not, grown to have fully like uh, functional breasts and we'll say what that really means in the Zerah Shimshon. What do we do? What should we do with our sisters on the day that she's being spoken of? If, she's a, if she becomes a wall, strong wall, we'll build a dome of silver above her. If she is a door, Natsur aleha luach ares. We uh, we shall carve uh, uh, on cedar wood. We shall carve upon her. Then the next part says, Ani choma. I am a wall. V'shadaim kamigdalot. I am a wall, and my my breasts are like towers. Az haiti be'enav kemoset shalom. Then I was in his eyes like one who found peace. No one says King Solomon's words are simple. They're not. That's why all of King Solomon's words, Shira Shirim is a song. King Solomon wrote an entire song. 
Now, when you went for, for, for the untrained eye, you read this song, you think it's a guy writing something to his uh, beloved or like here, his fiance or his wife. It's filled with, it's a love song, but it's extremely cryptic and extremely deep because in it, there are a lot of secrets. He is um, 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 mentioning different people without mentioning them. And most of the song actually is a love letter between Am Israel and HaKadosh Baruch Hu, right? It's, it's us versus Hashem or with Hashem. In this song, the Midrash says, in these few sentences, he's actually referring to someone else. Let's see who he's referring to. Midrash al Pasuk Lek Lecha. If you look at Midrash, Midrash Rabbah 39.3, if you look at that Pasuk, it says Lech Lecha, our parasha starts with the words Lech Lecha, which is God's command to Avraham. Hashem comes to Avraham and says, Lech Lecha Marzecha Muratecha, El Haaretz Hashar Eka. Leave your homeland and go to the place that I will show you. That was the first time Hashem gave a command to Avraham Avinu to leave his home. Rabbi Barachia Patach, Rabbi Barachia opened his darasha about this parasha by saying, Achot lanu katana. When the Pasuk in Shira Shirim says, We have a young little sister, Ze Avraham. This Pasuk is not talking about any girl. It's referring to Avraham Avinu. How so? She'ach et kol b'neha olam. Because Avraham was the person who united the entire world under one roof. Achot can mean sister, but the word ach or achva comes from the word achdut, le'ached, to unite. That's, that's a uniting factor. So... Rabbi Barachia says, when it says, when in Mishle it says, we have a young sister, it's actually talking about Abraham Avinu who came and united the entire world. How did he unite the entire world? He was the one, he was the first person to come with the ideology of monotheism, bringing everyone un under the Kanfesh Shechina, bringing everyone under the wings of God. Sha'at shehu katan hayam sagel misfodu ma'asim tovim. And from a young age, From a young age, he was he 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 gained lots of mitzvot and good deeds. That's why the pasuk refers to him as achot ketana, a young sister, a young sister. Meaning, from a very very young age, he began doing the mitzvot and good deeds when other people were not. Everybody else was just living their life nonchalantly, like nothing else. Veshadaim ella, when it says in she doesn't have breasts. It says, Lo henikuhu lo le mitzvot ve lo le maasim tovim. This means that no one nursed him to mitzvot and maasim tovim. He didn't have parents in his own. His, parent, his father was an idolater and he sold idols, right? So basically, he was never nursed and nurtured in the ways of Hashem. He found the way himself. No one taught him, no one forced him, no one asked him to. He did it on his own. Man asel achotenu bayim shayyidu barba. And then when the Pasuk says, what shall we do to our sister when she is spoken of? This is really important. When is she going to be spoken of? What does this mean? What is it referring to? It says, Nimrod, <laughs> Nimrod lived, that's where the word comes from. Nimrod lived at the time of Abraham Avinu. And he likened himself to a God and he wanted people to Bow to him. He was a conqueror. He was extremely smart. And he was extremely powerful. And it just got to his head. And he began telling people that he's a God and he's the one and people have to worship this God and that God. Abraham was the only one that wasn't. And he didn't like that. Why? Because Abraham became important. He started having followers. He started putting questions in people's minds. And here Nimrod uh, it's like, uh, what's going on? I, I got competition over here. He's taking everybody away from like, I, I'm the leader. I'm, I'm supposed to be leading everyone. So what does Nimrod do? It's this famous story of Ur Kastim. He builds a fire and he has Abraham thrown in the fiery furnace. And the Midrash says that Abraham Avinu comes out alive. Nothing happens to him. He's un unscratched. In fact, the people that built the fire, they all got killed. It was so huge. It was so big. Many people died building this fire. 
But Abraham walks out of it unscratched, right? So he says, "Bayom shegazar alav Nimrod l'reid the kivshan aresh on the day that Nimrod made the gazara, that he that um, the decree of throwing Abraham Avinu into the fire furnace. Um, that's the day that the angels began to speak about Abraham Avinu, and we'll see what that means when it says on the day that he's going to be spoken of." It's talking about the day that, hey, okay, what do we do? What happens now? Avraham is going to be thrown in a fiery furnace. Do we save him? Do we not save him? Does he deserve it? Does he not deserve it? What happens now? That's what it's talking about. What should we do on the day that he's spoken of? That's the day he was going to be spoken of in heavens. And then the pasuk continues. Im chomahi nivne aleha. If he's a wall, we'll build upon him. Towers. That's what it says. What does that mean? The Midrash continues. Says, if Avraham stands firm on his words, meaning he doesn't give up. They're threatening to kill him. They're threatening to throw him in a fire furnace. If he doesn't give up and he stands tall like a wall, then the Midrash says, Hashem said, I will build towers upon him. Meaning what? You'll see later as the Midrash, uh, as Zerah Shimshon explains. But what it really means is that he'll live on forever. There's going to be generation and generation after him. He'll be something eternal. There's going to be towers built upon this wall. But if he's a door, we'll carve carvings on him, like on cedar wood. What does that mean if he's a door? In dal hu be mitzvotu maasim tovim, daled comes from the word dal. Dal means um, 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 poor or, um, for lack of okay, poor, meaning he's not strong, he's not sharp enough, he's poor. If he's not going to be strong enough, he's going to be poor. Then natsur aleha luach eres. Then we'll draw on him like on a board, meaning. Just like this carving is not going to be eternal, it doesn't stay forever, it'll just get scratched off in time. So too here, if he's going to be, if, if he'll be like a dal, like a poor person, he's just going to give up easily, then his reward is going to be momentary also. It's not going to be eternal. Not, he'll not build anything for the future. Amar lefanav. So now comes the rebuttal. Avraham Avinu answers. The next part of the Pasuk, it's actually Avraham Avinu talking. This is Shlomo Melech in Nevoah, in, in, in prophecy. Ribon Ha'olamim, Master of the Universe. Ma'amid ani devarai kechoma. I will hold true to my words like a wall. Veshadai kamigdalot, and my breasts are like, um, are like towers. What did he refer to when he said my breasts are like towers? Zechananya, Mishael, Azaria. It's actually the Mishle is referring to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. These are three individuals that we're going to talk about very soon. Then the rest, the Pasuk concludes, then I was in his eyes like one who found peace. What does it mean like one, a person that found peace? Shenichnas beshalom veyatsa beshalom. Ad kanashalom. It's talking about the fact that Abraham Avinu went into the fiery furnace in peace and he came out in peace and nothing happened to him. That's the end of the Pasuk. The entire Pasukim in those parts of the Pasukim in Mishle is referring to Abraham Avinu jumping in the fiery furnace. So far so good, that was just the Mishnah. Not even an intro, that was just the Midrash. No, hold on, I need some of this. <coughs> <laughs> that was just the Midrash, not even an introduction. So far so good. Yes? I feel like nobody's listening to me here. Yes. Everyone's falling asleep. We need a whiteboard. We need a whiteboard. <laughs> That's a good idea. How about like a presentation? Like a, what is it called? Like a PowerPoint. PowerPoint. Like here's Abraham. And here. <laughs> That's funny. That's a good one. Lichora, now, the Zer Shimshon <laughs> is going to come up with his questions. And his question is pretty basic here. He says, Lichora kulo muqshemeresha le seifa. He says, honestly, the entire midrash is questionable. What are we talking about here? 
So the, the Zer Shimshon plainly just says, whoa, what just happened? The entire thing is a question. What is going on? What are we talking about? Like the Mishlei is talking about our sister and Abraham. So listen to what he says. Amnam, however, when you look at it, because what he's really saying is, it, it's saying that first Abraham amassed many mitzvot, and then it says no one actually nurtured into these mitzvot. So listen. Amnam kishenitaktek shapir davar hanamed me'anyanohu. But when you examine this Midrash, it's actually beautiful and there's a lot to be understood from it. When the Midrash says, when we're talking, when Mishle says, we have a young sister and this is Avraham. Avraham Avinu's job was to bring other people to do Teshuvah. He amassed thousands and thousands of students in a world where no one believed in anything. He was the first outreach personal, uh, personality. He was the first outreach rabbi. He would sit down with people and argue with them about God. You know the tent that he had and he invited guests in the tent? That was all a trick. He would have people, not a trick, but like he would invite people when they were thirsty and they were hungry. And then they would eat, you know, he would feed them amazing food, not like, like tongue and like really luscious, like you're like in a, 10 star restaurant, forget about a five star restaurant, washing their, do you go to a restaurant, do they wash your feet? <laughs> you know, it's like, wash your feet, clean up, you know? And then he would say, and then they would say, you know, thank you, Avraham, for the, it's, it's the Middle East, you have to have that accent. He's like, thank you! No, it's the Middle East, it has to be, a, you, the accent has to fit <laughs> the region. Uh, so, thank you, Avraham, very nice, good food, kebab was unbelievable. All right, so Abraham says, Abraham says, don't thank me. You know, I'm just a messenger here. Thank God. Thank God for the, for the food. Ah, listen, Abraham, don't become so religious, ultra. <laughs> <You're not gonna laughs> what are you trying to do to me? Abraham, you don't understand. I have a lot of pressure. I go home. I have to eat my, I have to eat my mom's gourmet sabzi. If I don't eat at home and tell her the meat is not kosher, I'm out of the house forever. Please, leave me alone. I'm not, listen, they would literally tell him like, oh, I don't believe in God, who said that? Nah, nah, nah. He says, what do you mean? God, the creator of all, da, da, da. You, gotta, you gotta be thankful for everything you eat. No, I'm gone. please leave me alone. Nah, nah. Okay, I don't say, all right, no problem. Here's your bill. He would give him a bill. I don't know if it was written on a piece of wood, paper, rock, whatever it was they were using those days. Maybe it was on a pad and texted to them. <laughs> Imagine, would you like it emailed or texted to you? <laughs> and it would say like for like a meal that on a regular in a five-star restaurant would cost like $50. Inflation. Uh, he would charge them like $1,200. And they would look at this bill and go, what are you talking? $1,200? My man, I'm dude, I didn't even finish the rest of it. It was like a piece of steak and I had like, and, uh, <laughs> what is that? Ram says, listen, buddy, you're in the middle of a desert. There is nothing else around. No water, no meat. Where else were you going to find this kind of food? Right? Now, if you're buying this food from me, that's how much I charge. Fair and square. If by chance it's a gift from God, gifts from God are free. Then we'll be like, you know, I think... <laughs> <laughs> like any smart Persian would do. <laughs> I think I believe in God like a thousand percent now all of a sudden. <laughs> now that I think about it, I'm going to write a book on God. <laughs> right? That's how we would try to convince people. Like, listen, let's think about this. Let's logically think about it. Like, where would you find food? Look at how Kadesh Baruch Hu put me over here so that I can see you when you're starving and you're thirsty and you could have food. Where would you have this kind of food? Anywhere else. You wouldn't. The fact that I'm here is because HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted me to be here. There is a God, there's Hashkacha Pratit. There's a divine providence that wanted you to survive, wanted you to have this food right now. Or else why would I by accident be on your way? Little by little, he would bring people into his way of thinking and teach monotheism to the world. He was an unbelievable cure of worker. Outreach to the max. So Avraham Avinu brought a lot of Jews. 
While he was still young, he had a lot of mitzvot and maasim tovim. He had done a lot of mitzvot. Veshadaim ella. Shelo hiniku lo le mitzvot o le maasim tovim. But the Mishlei says, but she didn't have breasts. Meaning what? She was never, um, 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 uh, what? No, 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 no. He, he was never like nurtured and nursed by his family, by anybody to have these beliefs. So he did all of this on his own. No one taught him how to do mitzvot or masim tovim. And on top of that, the Zerash Mishon says, you know what else? Aram Abri wasn't even commanded to do any mitzvot. He wasn't supposed to do any of them. He did them on his own because he knew it's the right thing to do. Avram Avinu was not commanded to do chesed. We're commanded to do chesed. He didn't have the Torah then. Avram Avinu did not have any commandments in the Torah. He kept them at his own will. So he says when the Midrash says he was never um, um, nursed or nurtured to have these things, he actually really means that he never had the he, obligation. He never had any push from any side or direction telling him to do these things. He did it on his own. He actually kept all of the mitzvot of the Torah. As it says, As the Torah itself says, as Abraham will listen to my words. Hashem is talking about Abraham Avinu keeping the mitzvot. He's listening to my words. Now we continue. As the Gemara says in Yoma, Avram Avinu even kept the laws of Eruve Tafshilin. Eruv Tafshilin, basic, I'm not going to even go into it. But it's, it's a rabbinic mitzvah. It's rabbinical. It's not even in the Torah itself. But the Gemara says, brings proof that Avram Avinu even kept mitzvot that were rabbinic mitzvot, that were not even given yet. I mean, the Torah wasn't given. But imagine the Torah wasn't given, and there was no rabbis to institute rabbinic laws either. But he kept those also. If you're asking in your mind, if you're thinking, how did he keep all these mitzvot without knowing what they are? I'll just explain it very, very short so that you're not confused later thinking like, I don't understand. How did Abraham keep the mitzvot without there being ever any mitzvot? How did he keep the Torah without there being a Torah? Right? It's quite simple. The Torah is the blueprint of creation. As it says, Hashem looked in the Torah and created the entire universe. Which means, if you tap into the creator's vision of the universe, you automatically know the Torah. Avraham Avinu had become so close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu that he tapped in into God's, so to speak, mind and kavanah, his intention. So he automatically just understood, yeah, I mean, I understand God, I understand HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and I know that in this universe you have to do X, Y, Z in order for you to do right. If you do ABC, you're doing wrong. If I eat this piece of meat with milk, I am destroying the universe. How? Maybe I know, maybe I don't know, but that is God's intention. I understand what Hashem wants and this is what Hashem wants. Today, we need the Torah to understand. Then they didn't need it. When someone became that spiritual, God connected to them directly so that I, they can understand God's own vision and intention. Does that make sense a little bit? Yeah, okay. The lady said yes, it means yes. Im hayalo atzar shelo nitztava. With all of this, Avram Avinu actually was, he, he, it, it pained him, the fact that he didn't have the mitzvot. The fact that he wasn't commanded to do the mitzvot bothered Avraham Avinu. He did the mitzvot, but it bothered him that he did it when he's not commanded. Aleph, in Kedushin, page 31a, it says, Amar Rabbi Hanina, Rabbi Hanina says, Gadol ha-mitzuveh ve-oseh Greater is the one who does the mitzvot while being commanded to the mitzvot than the person that does the mitzvot without being commanded. You would think the opposite is true. If you do a mitzvah, even though you're not commanded to do it, it's much better, right? It's a bigger mitzvah. But the exact opposite is true. The Gemara says, you know who gets greater sakhar? You know who gets greater reward? The person that's actually commanded to do the mitzvah and does the mitzvah. 
The person that's not commanded to do the mitzvah, that does the mitzvah, maybe gets a mitzvah, but not as great as the person that is commanded to do it. Simply put, why? If you're asking why that is true, one of the simple reasons they give is who uh, wants. Yeah, it's it's when you're told to do something, it's much harder for you to do it. Right? If I'm being commanded to do something, then already I have a negative inclination not to do it. That's what the Yetzirah is for. The Yetzirah knows what I want to do, what I'm supposed to do, and it tells me not to do what I'm supposed to do. If I'm not supposed to do something, the Yetzirah won't bother me. Hey, he's not supposed to do it anyway, so go, go ahead. Right? That's why when a non-Jew wants to convert to Judaism, when they're still not Jewish, they'll have a much easier time doing the mitzvot. The moment it kicks in and they're actually, the conversion is full, they'll start having a harder time, like every Jew does. <laughs> it ain't that easy. Okay. You know, what? Wait. They get a different Yitzhahara when they become Jewish? Who? The non-Jews. Oh, yes. The Yitzhahara have all kola Torah kula, but they didn't have it before. Sure. They get a Yitzhahara that tells them not to keep Shabbat. Before that, the Yitzhahara doesn't have to give, tell them. In fact, before that, the Yitzhara tells them, keep Shabbat, keep Shabbat, do it, keep Shabbat. You know why? Because it's a sur from the Torah for a non-Jew to keep the Shabbat. So there Yitzhara actually tells them, it's such a holy day, keep it, do it, do it, man. <laughs> you know? And then they become, and then once the conversion is full, they'll, they'll have a harder time because it's like, now I actually have to keep it, right? That's what I always tell ladies, you know, and he's gonna explain it in another way. I'm gonna explain it outside and we'll read it inside. It's beautiful. It's because, also, when you're not commanded to do something, you have nothing to lose. You either do it or you don't do it. You do it if you're, if you're allowed to do it, let's say, you get a mitzvah. You don't do it, you don't get an avera. You don't get a sin. All right, I, didn't, I, I chose not to do it. I'm not commanded to do it. But when you're commanded to do something, if you do it, you get a mitzvah. If you don't do it, you get an avera. You get a sin. That's the problem. There is a losing factor here for those that are commanded where there isn't for those that are not commanded. So uh, uh, sometimes I get like ladies that ask me like, you know, I want to put on tefillin. Why can't I put on tefillin? You know? So like, uh, it's like, of course you want to put on tefillin because you got no strings attached. You know, it's like, if you want to put on tefillin, you got to put it on like men put it on. If you tell me you'll put it on like men put it on, then by all means, let's do it. Let's see how long you last. For instance, let me give you an example. Hello, how are you? <laughs> Sorry. I'll give you a prime example. There was a, I'm not gonna bring examples, but there was a night not too long ago, I slept very, very late. I didn't sleep during the night. It was daytime when I went to sleep. Now, mind you, I have to pray shacharit. I have to put on tefillin. Now there's a time limit on what tefillot you're allowed to say when. You can't just pray all the prayers. You could get sakhar for the prayer, but you're gonna lose the timing. Like for instance, shacharit, you can only say the amidah, if you wanna get the mitzvah of shacharit at its correct time, it's like 9.40 something a.m. After that, nah. <laughs> right? With the tefillin. So like imagine sleeping at five, six o'clock, and having to get up again, wash your hands quickly, uh, do all your brachot and make it, and all the brachot from the beginning, I mean, it takes at least half an hour, 45 minutes to do all of shachari till you get to Amida. You have to first put the korbanot and all that. It's not just shema, and you're done, okay? I'm sorry, that's, that's, that's cheating. There's a lot that goes into it, right? And then, right. <laughs> yeah, I love it. The lady's like, I got up this morning and I and What did you do? I said the first part of Shema and the Amida. Oh my God, it was so long. You know? Yeah, we start from page one, literally, in the Sidur, page one. And it goes to like a page hundred something every morning. So you want to put on tefillin? Join me. <laughs> Every day. As we put on tefillin, start from page one, go all the way to like page hundred something. And then carry with you the guilt of missing one day in your life for the rest of your life. Anybody that's ever missed, God forbid, a day of tefillin knows how that feels. It's the worst feeling in the world. 
because you know that you're obligated, you gotta do it and you're used to, you do it every day. So the woman that says, I wanna put on tefillin, yeah, okay. That's because you got nothing to lose. If you, if you don't put it on, you didn't do an avera. You didn't, right? There's no avera because you're not obligated. Of course you wanna put on tefillin because you have no obligation. There's a, no, no losing chance for you. It looks pretty, <laughs> right? For us, like, 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 I'll give you another example. When, uh, when men get married, especially in the Sephardic community, uh, there's a minhag that when we get married, there's a second pair of tefillin that we start putting on every day. We have tefillin that is prescribed by Rashi, and there's tefillin that's prescribed by Rabbeinu Tam. Right? Now, we don't do it, most people don't do it when they're bar mitzvah and stuff, it's only Rashi, we wear Rashi. When we get married, many chachamim hold that as soon as you get married, it's good to start putting on the second pair as well. Which means you wear your tefillin, you do all of shacharit, and then at the end of shacharit, unwrap, wrap everything in there, make sure the chazan doesn't go too far and you don't lose yourself. Wrap another pair of tefillin, say shema with this one too, and half of their prayers have to be with this one too. Right? A lot of us are scared. I remember I was scared when I got married because I'm like, I don't, I don't know if I'm ready for this. I'm, I'm having enough of it, like uh, putting one pair. Now if I add the second pair and one day I miss putting the second pair, I'll never forgive myself. It's a very difficult decision. Now for a woman that's not obligated for the tefillin, of course, I'll, I want to put 15 pairs of tefillin. <laughs> You know, you'll do it once. You're like, oh, it was so spiritual. I felt like I've climbed mountains right now and I can talk to God and then you're over it. You know, and that, that, that's it, right? So like, like I've, I've had this discussion with women and I'm not I'm putting women down. I'm actually doing the exact opposite. I'll tell you why. Um, Sukkot comes and Ashkenazim have a minhag that they make a blessing on Lulav and Etrog. Even though even the Ramah himself says that, but we're not even going to get into that. Even Ashkenazim, I don't know, no, I'm not even going to talk about it. <laughs> Sephardim do not make a bracha on Lulav and Etrog. I don't know what gets into some women when it comes to Kota. I want to. Please. <laughs> I want to. You know, I've yet to meet one Sephardi woman that has actually bought a pair for $200. Because that's how much a good one costs right now. All right. You want to? Go pay $200. Come to Bet Knesset every single morning and shake. Shake the little oven and truck like you mean, and then I'll be like, okay, fine, she really wants to do it. No, what do they do? They come to shul, they come grab the rabbi by the tie. I want to make paracha, give me yours. I don't want to. Give me, I want to do, I want to do it. Like, why? Because you feel like you, you want to do something. You know why you want to do something? Because you're not going to miss anything if you don't do it. If I don't do the mitzvah of Lunar Vetrog, it's like I didn't put on tefillin today. Because I'm obligated. I have the mitzvah of Lunar Vetrog. It's not that you're not allowed to shake lulav and etrog. It that, it's that you don't have the obligation, which means you're not missing anything you don't. If you shake it, you get a mitzvah. You don't make a bracha on it, right? But come, shake it, you know? Not, but some women say, no, but I want to make the bracha. Hey, but why? I want to. But, like, but you're not, like, why? It, it, I don't understand. I, I, that's what I'm saying, like, because you feel you're not losing anything, of course you want to, but that's not how it works. That's why the person, so going back, why are women so, some women, not you guys of course here, but why are so some women so adamant about it? Why? Because subconsciously they understand that I do it, I don't do it, it won't matter. It'll be a good feeling for me to do it once, which is nice, it's great. And the fact that they want to do it so badly proves the point. The fact that they want to do it so badly is because they're not commanded to do it. When you're not commanded to do something, it comes easier for you. It's like, it's always like that. Yes, I want to. I've never heard a non-religious woman come to me and go, I want to so badly keep Shabbat. I want to do it. No, you know why? Because you're commanded to. And many of us have difficulty with keeping Shabbat. Many of us have it. Why is it that no woman comes to a rabbi and says, Rabbi, help me, I don't want to drive to shul this Shabbat. I want to keep Shabbat, I want, many, many do, I'm not saying no one does. But, but 
I'm just saying, like, you don't hear them begging for it like they do for the lulav and etrog. And the tef- uh, why? Because those you're actually commanded to. Those a woman is also commanded to. So they have the same yetzer hara that I do. They have the same difficulty that I do. Just like I have a difficult time keeping Shabbat, they also have the difficult time keeping Shabbat. So you don't see them begging like, <laughs> you know, unless they're becoming Baal Teshuvah, Bezrat Hashem, yes, right? But they have the same different inclination when they go to the bathroom and go, oh man, I turned it on again. <laughs> you know, how many times does that happen? Like you go to the bathroom and then you always find someone to blame. It's your fault. I just turned on the bathroom lights again. Like why? I don't know. Because <laughs> you feel so garbage at that moment when you flipped on the light. I know you've all done this. Don't look at me like I'm crazy. I'll one-up it for you too. I know you've done this one too. You turn it on and turn it off. And then you go, oh man. <laughs> How many times have we done that? We feel so awful when we turn it on and go, ah, no. You're like, oh man, I turn it off. It's like, you know, I'll double that for you. <laughs> Ever happen when you turn it on and turn it off again? No, 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 turn it on again. <laughs> that never happened to me. If it happened to you, hell. Okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm kidding. That's a joke. All right. <clears throat> so, um, now that the comedy stand up session is over, going back to the Zerashim Shon. So, th- and that's the reason he's going to give. The reason he's going to give that it was, I, I, I feel is brilliant is because those that are not commanded to do mitzvot, they don't have anything to lose, right? And because they don't have anything to lose, obviously they're not going to be rewarded as much. When you have a person that goes on a mission, the harder the mission, the greater the reward, right? So when you have a mission that you're commanded to do, obviously you're going to get a great reward because you risked everything to do it. There was a risk involved. When there's no risk involved, yes, you're going to get some reward, but it's not going to be as great as the person that risked everything for the mission. Same with the mitzvot. So Avram Avinu was upset. I know that I'm supposed to do, I know that I'm doing the mitzvot, but I'm not commanded to do the mitzvot. I wish I was commanded so that I could receive the full reward for the mitzvot that I'm doing so that I'll get the full amount. So now, Where do you go? Sorry. Right. So now, it says, Man Listen to how the Zerashim is going to build on this now. So the next part of the Pasuk says, What should we do with the, our sister? With our sister now? On the day that she's going to be talked about. And we said, What is the day that she's going to be spoken of? It's the day that Nimrod is going to throw him in the furnace. And then we said, the Pasuk says, Im choma, if she's a wall, we'll build upon her. If she's a, like a door, then we'll just carve something, which is momentary. So listen to this. Shekatvu sham, the Tosafot says, Al hahi de gadol ha The Tosafot in the Gemara, there are commentaries in the Gemara that say, when we say that someone that is commanded gets re- more reward than someone that's not commanded for the mitzvot, it says, Someone that is, why is, what's the reason that someone that does mitzvot, even though they're commanded, is better? Because the person that has the commandment worries more about the mitzvah that maybe I'll mess it up, maybe I won't do it. The worry of you messing up the mitzvah itself gets your reward. Like when you slept at six o'clock in the morning and you can't sleep. You wake up every half an hour. Is it nine yet? Oh, did I miss Shema? I have to get up. I have to. <laughs> like you're, you're really, you, and that's really what happens. I'm telling you, ask any religious guy that, that has to make the time for Shema and Amidah. They'll tell you, like, I, I slept at six, but I really didn't sleep. Because every like half an hour I woke up because I'm like, oh, I got to get up now. I got to get up. I can't. I, you know, because you have to make shacharit on time. Now, 
as opposed to someone that's not commanded to the mitzvah, there's no worry for them. And the example was, he brings is, sheyesh lo pat besalo, sheyem yirtzei yaniach, or not. So it's because the person that doesn't have the commandment to do the mitzvot is like a person that has bread in their basket, but they're not hungry. If they want, they'll eat. If they don't want, they don't. Ah, okay. You know, someone that doesn't have the commandments of the mitzvot, I'll do them. I don't do them. I'm not, not going to miss out on it. I'm not losing anything if I don't do it. I'm just not going to gain a little bit more. But I'm definitely not going to do anything wrong. I'm not going to be punished for not doing the mitzvot. A woman is not going to be punished for not shaking the Lubav Netzrog on, on Sukkot. Absolutely not. She'll get a mitzvah for shaking it, according to many, but vice versa. She doesn't do it. No, no, no harm done. No harm done whatsoever. Ad Kanashono says, When Nimrod made the gezera, the decree to throw Abraham Avinu into the fiery furnace, Hayu bedin shel mana mitiyare im penloti hiye lo kol kach ta'agat hachet yaan lo nitztava. All of the angels of Shamaim started thinking, whoa, maybe Abraham is not going to go through with this. He's not going to sacrifice himself. He's not going to stand true to his beliefs in Hashem. Why? Because at the end he's going to be like, why should I do this? I'm not even commanded. Why should I give my life up for something that I'm not even commanded to do? I don't have any mitzvot. Who told me that I have to be the outreach professional here? I, I quit. You know, Nimrod wants to kill him. So he stands up and says, you know what? I'm done. Yeah, no problem. No one told me that I have to be the one and true leader. I won't be. So in Shamaim they said, whoa, maybe Abraham is going to lose. Only because he's going to think, look, I'm not commanded to do this. I wasn't commanded to do the mitzvot. I don't have the Torah. So fine. Hello, I'll tell them. Okay, Nimrod, you win. What's the big deal? Right? And he won't sacrifice his life. And by doing that, Hashem's name will not be sanctified. By Abraham sacrificing himself, he sanctified God's name. Immensely in front of everybody. Everyone that did Teshuvah, when they saw Abraham came out alive from the fiery furnace, everybody repented, everyone started believing in God, even Nimrod himself. So in Shamayim they were saying, whoa, even though Abraham is not commanded to do this, but if he does it, there will be an amazing Kiddush Hashem Shamayim. It's going to be a Kiddush Hashem, sanctification of God's name. And if he doesn't, he's going to miss that opportunity. O Dilma, yimsor atzmo, avalo yimsor atzmo al Kiddush Hashem. Or maybe, I love this part, or maybe he will sac sacrifice his life. Maybe he will jump in, but he won't do it for all the right reasons. He won't do it purely for God. He'll do it because he wants to prove a point. Many of us do that. You know, he'll do it because he's like, ah, you think you scare me, Nimrod? I'll jump. Yeah, just to prove you wrong. What would happen if he did it like that? What would happen if Avraham Avinu would jump into the furnace just to prove his point? Prove that I'm right, you were wrong. You know what would happen? He would die. You know how we know that? Because his brother did that and he died. So in Shamayim there was a whole tumult. But what do we do? What if Avraham Avinu jumps in? First of all, what if he doesn't jump in? Because he says, why should I? Second of all, what if he jumps in but he does it for an ulterior motive? Like, you know, okay, fine. Not for Kiddush Hashem Shamayim, but I'm sick and tired of this Nimrod guy, you Nimrod. You know, yeah, I'm going to prove you once and for all, I ain't scared of you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and he jumps in, oh boy, if he jumped in like that, we would have a problem. Sharelon Itztava, because he wasn't, at the end of the day, he wasn't commanded. Rakim Surashom okay. Afim Tavo Alehem Mita, one second. Right, okay. Beteretz lahem agadosh baruchu. So he says, Hashem answers these, so to speak, angels in the heavens. Hashem says, Im chomahi, <coughs> if she shall be a wall, meaning, Dahainu, Im ma'ami devaram ke choma kelo nitztava hagam shelo nitztava. If he stands tall like a wall and acts as a person that is commanded to do the mitzvot, even though he's not really commanded, just like the Tosafot said that someone that is someone that is 
um, um, commanded to do the mitzvot is more fearful of the mitzvot, fearful of missing out on the mitzvot, worries about them more. It says, then Hashem says, Az nivne aleha. This is God's guarantee. It says, if Avraham sacrifices himself, as if he was actually commanded to do so for the right reasons, he will become eternal. I will build towers upon him, meaning his name will be forever and he'll have children that will sustain forever. That's going to be my gift to him. But if he's like a, a door dal, meaning if he's poor and he doesn't, Meaning, if he does the mitzvah, he does the mitzvah, but not l'shem shamayim. Not for heaven's sake. He does it to keep his word. Arrogance, uh, my word, I don't care. I said God exists, you said he doesn't. You want to you wanna throw me in a firmness, so be it. I don't care, you don't scare me, right? If he does it for that reason, as lo yen mitzol, then he will not be saved. Here, I think when he says he will not be saved, I think he means that it's going to be temporary. He'll still be saved. But then he'll live out his life. He'll, that will be his reward. He won't be generation after generation. Not that type. He says he'll have riches. He'll have wealth. He'll have everything he needs in this life to be comfortable. But a long life, meaning an everlasting life, eternal life, he will not receive. I will only give him his reward temporarily. Then it says, then the pasuk comes out, the answer of Abraham Avinu. Ani choma. That's the next part of the pasuk in Shira Shirim. Abraham Avinu says, Ani choma. I am a wall. I will stand by my words like a wall. I will hold on to the mitzvot as if I was really commanded to do them. That's how important they are to me. I will keep them. This is beautiful. Says, and my breasts are like towers. And the Midrash says, what does these breasts of Abraham refer to? Chananya, Mishael, Azaria. Who was Chananya, Mishael, and Azaria? Okay. In a time of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar Harasha, who destroyed the temple, he exiled everyone to Babylonia. Many people. Many stayed in Eretz Israel, but he took all of the Chachamim and the great people, took them into Babylonia. Many of them very, very young. He took young, genius Jews in his own palace, and he had them, quote unquote, educated in his palace. Meaning he took young boys that he understood are very wise, and he started educating them in, in Babylonian uh, way of life. And he wanted to raise them to become leaders of Babylonia. He understood that these Jews, they could lead the world. So he took the best ones in his own palace at a young age, trained them to become heads of courthouses and heads of different things. And one of which was our prophet, Daniel. The whole story of Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar and being thrown into the... Uh, 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 Lion's Den was what was with, that, that's the whole story. Why was he in Babylonia to begin with? Why were they so nice to him? It was because they brought him there. They trained him to be one of theirs. He was like a prophet for them. So it was four of them. It was Daniel, Mishael, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. These four were brilliant kids that were taken into Babylon at a young age to be used later on. Now, all these people that he took at a young age, he was training them to be idolaters. Da, da, da. Nebuchadnezzar comes years later, he builds a st like a statue of himself in the middle of the city. And his plan was he's going to bring everyone as a show of might and have everyone simultaneously bow down to this idol. And that would be a show of conquering everyone, even the Jews. I got them. He comes. There's a whole ceremony, unveiling or whatever it is. And uh, he gives the word for everyone to bow. Everybody bows except Hananya, Mishael, and Azariah. Daniel wasn't there. He was on a mission. It was Hananya, Mishael, and Azariah. They don't bow. Nebuchadnezzar says, how dare you? What are you, what are you, 
What are you doing? What are you doing in front of everybody? They're like, no. He says, don't you have respect? I, I'm the king. You have to, he says, they answer him nicely. Respect, you're the king. You, you were given permission to destroy the temple. You're definitely a powerful king, but we only bow to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So he says to Mishael, Hananya, Mishael, and Azariah, no problem. Calls people out, goes, build an entire, build a huge furnace, just like in the time of Abraham. We're going to throw them into the fire in front of everyone. You don't stand up against me and not, you know, execute my orders. They go, so be it. They make a fiery furnace and they throw Hananya, Mishael, and Azariah in it. And they come out alive. This is not in the time of Avraham Avinu. This is 2,000 years ago in Babylonia. After this happens, Nebuchadnezzar turns to all the other ones and says, you losers, you have such a powerful God and you were afraid of me and you bowed to me. Look at what your God did to them for them. Save them from a fiery furnace. I cannot believe, this is the king saying, I cannot believe you listened to me and you bowed to me when you have such a powerful God behind you. This is how smart he was. And Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were saved from the fiery furnace. So he says, Avram Avinu and Nevuah saw these three individuals. And he was answering in Shamayim, not only am I a wall, also my generations later, those that will be nursed through me, so to speak. He says, my breasts are like towers. What towers? He was talking about these giants. And he says, not only that, but I have in generations to come, people because of me will throw themselves into fiery furnaces and will be saved. Why does Avram Avinu bring the example of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah? He brings to Safot that says, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were not commanded to sacrifice their lives at the time. Why? Because Tosafot says in the Gemara, technically speaking, if they would have bowed to him, it would not have been considered idolatry because it was not a real idol. Meaning, they could have had the lenient approach and said, listen, uh, they could have talked to each other and go, listen, halachically, if you really think about it, it's not really an idol. Halahi doesn't know that. <laughs> but if we bow to it, we're not idolaters. Like, it's like, it's basically like, okay, um, um, they brought, it's like they brought glad kosher meat, but those guys didn't know that it's glad kosher and they're telling them, eat this pork. And they start talking to each other, by the way, you do know it's not pork, it's glad kosher beef. <laughs> <laughs> he don't know that. <laughs> but if we eat, we didn't do anything wrong, technically. The only thing that would be wrong is it would be a chilul Hashem. Because everybody else thinks they're eating treif. They know it's not. In this situation, it was the same. They knew it's not idolatry, which means they did not have a command to sacrifice their life. That's one of the things that you're supposed to sacrifice your life for. One of the things in the Torah that you're supposed to sacrifice your life for and not do the Avera is idolatry. Here, they were exempt and they still jumped into the fire. So Avram Avinu is telling HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I am not the kind of guy that you'll say, because I'm not commanded, I'll take it easy. No, I will sacrifice my life for you even though I'm not commanded. And to show you how serious I am about doing my mitzvot and the love that I have for HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I will have children in generations to come 2,000 years later that will do the same exact thing when they're not commanded to do so. Chananya, Mishael, Vazariya. Those are my towers that, I, that are built on top of me. It's an amazing Mishle of Shlomo HaMelech. The way Avraham Avinu, now you read the story of Lech Lecha and Ur Kastim and how Hashem saves Avraham Avinu. You're not thinking, you're thinking about a childish story that you read in a little Midrash says when you were a kid or you're, you're in your school or whatever. Yeah, Avraham Avinu jumped in the furnace. You don't know the details of what went on in Avraham Avinu's mind. The tug of war that he had in his neshama that I'm not really commanded to do this. Should I? Like, if I don't jump in, if I, do, if I just bow to him, I've done nothing wrong. I have no mitzvot. 
I can continue. Like he could have thought to himself, okay. He could have thought to himself, he kills himself now. He'll never be able to do any more kiruv, outreach with anybody else. He'll never be able to teach God's ways to anybody else anymore. It'll be over. So logically he would think to himself, let him just give in to this guy once. It won't even mean anything. And then he'll just go to another town and just do his thing and bring so many other people into God's ways. But Abraham said, I'm not. I will not sacrifice a moment of Kiddush Shem Shamayim. My job right now is to do Kiddush Hashem. You know how many people in the Holocaust did the same exact thing when they didn't have to? Do you know how many Chachamim gave their lives on the spot for such smaller details, so to speak? You know, there were <clears throat> German soldiers caught a rabbi and they opened the Sefer Torah in front of him, uh, unrolled a Sefer Torah scroll in front of him on the floor. And I told him, we'll let you go if you walk on this Sefer Torah. Now, according to Halakha, he's not supposed to give up his life. He shouldn't. He doesn't have to. Because his life is more important than a Sefer Torah. That's not one of the things that a person gives up their life for. But he didn't do it. He wouldn't do it. They say they rolled him in the Sefer Torah and they, I, they shot him through the scroll and they just left him there for the dead. Neighbors came and buried him in the Sefer Torah. Now you ask yourself then why? If he if it had no command to do that, why? So other rabbis said, you know why? Because in that moment, to him, that was a commandment. Because the Kedushah Hashem that you're doing, you're sanctifying God's name. What are they trying to do? These Nazis, Yamach Shemam Azikram, they weren't trying to like desecrate a Sefer Torah. They don't even know what a Sefer Torah is. What are we trying to do? They're trying to prove a point. Their point was that your God is meaningless. Your Torah is meaningless. You're nothing. Look, how many people are watching? <laughs> Everyone's going to watch as you walk on this Sefer Torah. So he said to himself, that is a much bigger deal than me walking on a Sefer Torah. You want to desecrate God by me not allowing it. I'm allowed to, but I won't do it. Now these people, they're neshamot, untouchables, untouchables. But that's, where does that come from? Where does that mesirut nefesh come from? Where does that self-sacrifice come from? Avraham Avinu. It's in our genes. Jews gave up their lives for centuries to remain Jews for reasons they didn't even have to. They got beaten up, they got, they got, they got thrown in jail just for being a Jew. And it's so sad, unfortunately, that today's day and age, it's become so trivial, you know? People give up their Judaism for the stupidest things. I remember hearing a story about this, this, these two guys that had gone to a restaurant. <clears throat> um, uh, they went to a, rest, a non kosher restaurant in some country, whatever, and they were talking about how the uh, pork loins or whatever it was is the best in Israel. So, make his story short, when the guy comes to take their order, he just laughingly says, it's, it's funny how, like, you guys are Jewish. And they go, yeah. He goes, so like your ancestors gave up their lives for centuries to remain Jewish so that you can come and sit here comfortably and have pork. You know, if you want prophecy coming out of the mouth of somebody random, you know, and obviously right there, the food became kuft for them, <laughs> as they say, and they decided not to eat. But, it's, but, but we have to think of this all the time. We live in such comfortable times we, lived in such, we live in such luxury that we take things for granted. And we have to think to ourselves, our ancestors gave up everything to have matzah on Pesach. They gave up everything to have kosher meat. They gave up everything to be raised like a true Jewish woman. They gave up everything for tzniut. They gave up everything for my great-grandmother, Allah Shalom. There's a story I have from my great-grandmother. In the time of the Shah of Iran, um, they made one, at one point, when there were too many people becoming too religious in the Muslim world, in, in Iran, people started wearing 
scarves again and rusaris and like uh, burqas and everything like that. Uh, uh, they made a law, the king made a law that the police would go in the streets, whoever was covering their head, they would take off the coverings. If you had a burqa or whatever, they would pull it off. For like a few years, it was in a in, in, uh, thing. My great grandmother did not leave her house for two years. She didn't leave home because she wouldn't walk out without covering her hair. You try not going out of your house for a week. We lost our minds during COVID and we had TV, internet, news. They had nothing from the outside world. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. They gave up everything because they wanted to remain Jews like a real Jew is supposed to be. You know the famous parable of Chazal says the sun and the wind had a, uh, 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 like a wager. And there's a guy walking on the street wearing a coat. And I say, uh, I bet you I can take off that guy's coat like that. And the sun says, I bet you I can. So, all right, the wind says, let's see who does it faster. I'll start. The wind starts blowing and it starts blowing and it starts blowing and it starts, the guy is holding on to this jacket like it, there's nothing else. And the wind is, it's like he's flying, but the jacket is, he's holding on to the jacket. Finally, the wind gets tired. The sun says, all right, step aside, my friend. Watch how it's done. And it gets hotter and it gets hotter and it gets hotter. And the guy just takes off the jacket by himself. Our galut today is the sun, our exile. There was a time that we had to hold on to our beliefs with all of our might. When you do that, you're holding on tight. But then there's a time that comes, it's warm. You're sitting at the beach. By yourself, you take everything off because you're comfortable. When we get comfortable, sometimes we forget who we are. But we cannot forget that we come from Avraham Avinu. Avraham Avinu was a person that through comfort and hardship, he kept everything. Even though he was in commanded to keep it, he kept it because he understood that it means something for him and for the future. You know, Rabbi Vadi Yosef, we said, Zatzal, you're his yard site. Uh, I cannot begin to even tell you the stories of his Mesirut Nefesh, the self sacrifice that he had in life to become who he was. People see videos of him today and pictures of him with this coat and his. His garb is golden and he's like a king. He was like a king. But he would often talk about how, he was, don't look at me like this. He would say there was a time that could ba he barely had food to eat. On a daily basis, he barely had what to eat. But he kept learning Torah, he kept teaching, he kept doing the mitzvot. No matter what. Because that's what you do. You're a Jew through thick and thin. You figure it out. You got to do it. It's our, it's our duty to be the nation of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So you do it through thick and thin. And he used to always say, he who keeps, keeps the mitzvot in hardship will see days that will be able to keep it like a king. And he would point to himself and say, look at me today. Because I kept the mitzvot and I kept learning Torah when he didn't have money, when he didn't have food. He says, Baruch Hashem. He came to a point that he would, they would fly him around with a helicopter for him to give classes, not even drive in, the, in traffic because he didn't want to waste time. He would travel by helicopter from city to city in Eretz Israel, so he's not sitting in traffic. He would land here, give a shiur in Tel Aviv, go back, land in Yerushalayim, give another shiur, go back, land in... Eh. He wouldn't waste a second. Not a second of his life was wasted. One time... Um, um, he was traveling with, uh, sometimes he was traveling with other dignitaries, other rabbis. One time, the guy was like five minutes late. And Rabbi asked the pilot, where, where did this guy go? And the pilot's like, I don't know. He went, and he goes, from now on, I'm flying solo. No one's coming with me. My time is valuable. Five minutes is five minutes. This is people's time. I'm trying to teach Torah to Am Yisrael. Five minutes is a long time. That's what he was. That's how he became so great. It's been, it's been 11 years and every single time as your side comes all over the world, there is Masibahs, there's, there's different things, people gathering, learning Torah in his name. And his, he really affected the world in his generation, just like an Avraham Avinu in his generation. 
Each and every single one of us with the mitzvot that we have can be an Abraham Avinu in our generation. Everyone has their responsibilities. Everyone has their ways of doing things. Day by day, we take it one step at a time. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen v'amen.